In this chapter, I'm going to be telling you a lot about the story of Qatar. And there's no better place to tell you the story of my country than this beautiful architectural marvel that I'm in now, which is the National Museum of Qatar. It's inspired by the Desert Rose. The Desert Rose is a unique rock formation that can be found in the Qatari desert. Qatar today is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and that hasn't always been the case. The story goes back to the people's journey through centuries of turbulent pearl diving, which sustained the economy till the discovery of oil, which finally allowed the country to secure a progressive future for its people. Let's take a look through a brief history of Qatar. The land of Qatar has been home to countless human settlements over the past millennia. We have Stone Age, Bronze Age and Iron Age evidence of coastal encampments and trade artifacts. These encampments and artifacts have been preserved and undergoing further research. There are also petroglyphs, which are basically rock carvings from the Neolithic period that further demonstrate that humans resided in Qatar's desert landscape. In this place called Al Jasisiyah, there are 874 of these petroglyphs depicting things like boats and fish. Even in the early days, Qatar was a seafaring nation. Qatar was first settled by several nomadic communities, and this patch of land, pivotal for its geographical location, has been part of many empires and civilizations, from the Persians to the Islamic Caliphate and the Ottomans. Throughout all of these empires and civilizations, quick access to the ocean was a necessity for the development of our country. This is an area called Al Bida, which was an old port town. Nowadays, a neighborhood in Doha, this was a prime location for the fishing industry as well as the pearl diving industry. While the pearl trade brought profits to the people, the process of pearl diving was not easy. During summer, men would head out to the sea to collect pearls. I'll take a big breath and they'd have a stone weighing around their foot and a net around their neck to collect the oysters. Once the pearl divers had gathered all they could carry, the men in the boat above would pull them up. Then the crew would go through the oyster shells in the hope that they are finding a pearl. And they would stay on that boat for months at sea, hoping to come back home with riches. The practice of pearl diving in the Gulf goes back to about 7,000 years and is one of the oldest professions in Qatar. The pearl banks in the Arabian Gulf were plentiful. More importantly, the demand for pearls made it profitable. So you can imagine why it was so important for local economies. The pearling season also came with its own celebration. al desha is the term for the start of the pearl diving season. It refers to the day the dows would leave the coast. The season would usually begin in May and end in September. The celebration would include preparations to equip the dows and their crew for a long season away at sea. There would be singing, drums being played and food being served. Al Desha would be a sad day for the families of the pearling crew as they would be unsure if the men would return at the end of the summer. As the men would be out at sea, women were the center of the home and the family life within the communities. They would run the household and tend to their families and their animals. And obviously, if there was a celebration sending them away, when the men returned at the end of the season, there would be an even bigger celebration as the dows would dot the horizon again. The months of long anxiety would fade but not without one final crescendo. As the boats would start to dock, families would call out to the divers and ask if they're in good health and if they all made it back safely. If the answer was yes, it would be celebrated with various customs and traditions, including songs, dances and games. This celebration is called al Gafal. It would breathe life back into the whole community. At one point, almost half of the population of Qatar was employed by the pearl diving industry. But as pearl diving was growing in the 1800s, Qatar was changing. On December 18th, 1878, Sheikh Mohammed bin Thani emerged as an influential leader who united the tribes of the peninsula under one flag to protect the land from foreign and external interests, which is now celebrated as the National Day of Qatar. As Qatar was moving towards independence though, it was facing a lot of regional conflict. The Ottoman Empire first got control of Qatar in 1538 and regained control again in 1871. But by this point, the Al Thani family were respected as the leaders of Qatar. And so there was more resistance about having Ottoman rule in Qatar. The Battle of Al Wajba in 1893 was a defining moment for Qatar's hopes of becoming an independent state. The battle was won by Qatar and the Ottoman rule retreated with official renouncement of their power by the early 20th century. 
Following the Ottoman rule, the Sheikh signed a treaty in 1916 so that Qatar would become a British protectorate, which basically meant that Qatar was controlled and protected by Britain. And this treaty came to an end on September 3rd, 1971, allowing Qatar to become fully independent. In the early 1900s, the people of Qatar were facing struggle after struggle. In 1925, a terrible storm hit the Arabian Gulf and it's known as Sinat al-Tab'a. The storm killed around 8,000 people, almost half of the seafaring population at this time in Qatar. Then in the 1930s, a Japanese engineer, Kochiki Mikimoto, invented cultured pearls that can be created in controlled oyster farms. This technique allowed pearls to become easier and cheaper to make. Consequently, this led to a collapse of the pearling industry in Qatar and the Gulf region. The real turning point for Qatar though was the discovery of this natural resource, oil. In 1939, oil reserves were discovered right here on the west coast of Qatar called the Dukhan oil field. Unfortunately for Qatar, the Second World War delayed any major extraction, but a second oil field found offshore north of Qatar began the country's large-scale export of oil. As the world's dependence on oil and gas had grown, so is Qatar's economy. Okay, so that was just a quick overview on some of the main points on Qatar's history. We don't have time to go any deeper in this course, but if you'd like more information, you can visit some of our incredible museums yourselves. Let me share a few of my favorites. First is the National Museum of Qatar, where I am right now. This is a great place to start if you want to learn more about the history of the country throughout the ages. It features both permanent and temporary exhibitions and has 11 striking galleries. Next is the Museum of Islamic Art, which showcases Islamic art throughout world history. This is one of the most comprehensive collections of Islamic art in the world, with masterpieces from every corner of the globe representing the diversity found in Islamic heritage. When you're at the Museum of Islamic Art, there's also a library and a park close by where you can enjoy a walkthrough and admire the architecture of the building during your visit here. And my last recommendation are the Mesherib Museums. These explore Qatar's untold stories. They're four historic houses that celebrate the history of my country. They tell the stories of Qatar that other places don't. Qatar does have a rich heritage, an interesting story. So when you visit, I really recommend that you dive a little deeper and take a look back at how Qatar, my country, came to be.